Hi and welcome. Welcome to one of our special manifesto videos. I'm joined today by Robert and Gabby. We're talking about the tax related aspects of some of the party manifestos which haven't been covered as part of the mainstream media. So Robert, what is the tax strategy for the main parties? I think it's fair to say that one can genuinely ask the question, do any of them actually have a tax strategy? Certainly when you look at the manifestos, for example, for the Labour Party, it is very light on tax increases. It talks about perhaps 8 billion of tax increases. Given that we spend something like 1 trillion or get 1 trillion a year in tax, it's virtually nothing. It genuinely is basically nothing. And then if you look at a lot of the other parties, the Lib Dems, they have one or two ideas, but they're quite weak. And if you look at the Conservative Party, you just have to look at the way, for example, that they've had to kind of develop things from a tax perspective during the election. So they weren't probably covered in the manifesto. So the idea, for example, of having a special tax allowance for pensioners, that wasn't in the manifesto per se, it's just come along. I think the problem is that there's a lack of proper tax policy of tax. They don't really know what they want the UK to look like from a tax and business perspective and how those two fit together. So I think it's quite disappointing. To be slightly fairer to the Green Party and the Reform Party, they've actually had a slightly more detail in their tax manifestos and there's some sort of more coherence from a tax perspective, albeit both of those policies also have big black holes in them in terms of either you know, totally unfunded stuff from the Reform Party, 30 or 40 billion potentially unfunded tax cuts and things like that. <laughs> Given that 40 billion was what Quateng did a couple of years ago, pretty significant. And then if you look at the Green Party, they talk about things like wealth taxes. Well, wealth taxes fundamentally in most cases have not worked with if they've had them in the world. There's been one or two cases where they have worked, but more often than not they failed. And then they also talk about things like NIC loopholes for people on 50,000 a year. That's not an NIC loophole, it's an integral part of the tax system. And the fact that really in the UK tax in NIC is a merged tax. Yes, you have different pieces of legislation, I think, but fundamentally it's a merged tax. But they would end up with people, say, on 50,000 a year having a marginal tax rate above that of 48% because of their changes, because you're allegedly wealthy. I don't think most people in London, at least, on that sort of money would consider themselves anything like wealthy. I mean, I, I would completely agree. I think at the moment, in terms of what we're looking at, it's been very detailed light. Um, I also think, fundamentally, there needs to be much more coherent thinking in terms of the direction that um, the incoming government wants tax policy to take and how that should be interwoven with broader policy objectives and therefore I think a much more fundamental rethink is required in a lot of areas. And in fairness, and I completely agree, you, you're very unlikely to get that level of detail in a manifesto um, and to be perfectly honest, many people reading the manifestos I think wouldn't necessarily understand that level of detail and it's not necessarily going to drive people's voting behaviours. But I think that's fundamentally probably one of the biggest priorities for, from a tax perspective for an incoming government. I mean, it's interesting, actually. I mean, you, you touched on the, the Reform Manifesto and um, one of, I think one of their, their sort of policies on VAT was to increase the VAT registration threshold, which has been, um, until actually the last spring budget, static for such a long period of time. Putting that up to 150,000 on the basis that it would be of huge benefit to small and medium-sized businesses. Um, I think it's an interesting policy. So I think there, on the one hand, there will be people who would look at that and say, you know, we've seen enormous fiscal drag in the registration threshold. This just puts it to where it probably should be. Um, and perhaps could also offer a measure of simplification because we might not need some of the more complex special accounting schemes for smaller businesses like the flat rate scheme. Mm -hmm. um, so potentially some benefits, but on the flip side, I think, you know, you have to look at it from the point of view of, well, actually of how much benefit is this to, you know, entrepreneurial business? And I, you know, when you look at that, I think you, you're really just moving the, the position of the handbrake. You're just increasing yeah. it slightly. Because, let's be honest, if you're a genuinely entrepreneurial business which is looking to grow and grow quickly, that 150,000 threshold is basically nothing. You should mm. be, hopefully be there in a year or two and you'll be on it. So you're still going to get caught by mm. the whole system in due course. And I think then the other side of it is clearly some people who will always be below that 150,000 threshold, even perhaps below the 90,000 threshold, if you're supplying to businesses which are VAT registered, 
they may still want you to be VAT legislated just because they can get their input VAT back, for example. Yeah, I, I mean, I, th I think that's a fair point, that the areas that we do know about are very sort of headline um, if very sort of headline issues. So, you know, from a, a Labour perspective, we're aware of their policy on um, putting VAT on private school fees. Um, obviously, there's a lot of detail that um, we don't know about in terms of how such a policy would be implemented or when it would be implemented. But there is obviously that that's a, you know, even in the context of the VAT system, that's a very small aspect of the overall system. And there's lots of other areas that I think are, you know, potentially fertile areas that, that you know, an incoming government could explore um, to really drive change. And, and you know, f actually some of which I think would be for a broader social benefit. Mm. Um, if we take, for example, energy saving materials or, mm. you know, electric vehicle charging just as two. You know, clearly, well, with the exception of the Reform Party, pretty much everybody else accepts we need to be kind of more environmentally friendly mm. as a country. And, you know, that's just not the UK, that's a European thing. So things that drive that and are part of that. And that's, again, where tax, business and kind of your overall goals should be kind of merged mm. and coherent. And at the moment, I don't think they really are. And kind of going back to the VAT and school fees, 1.5 billion, nothing. Mm. Fundamentally, absolutely nothing. But it's also quite possible that in three or four years' time, they'll get none of that because people will have changed their behaviour. I.e., fine, I can't afford the school fees. We're going into... The state system or whatever. Well, and just and just at a practical level, I mean, you know, these are estimated numbers. When you drill into, you know, we know so little of how such a policy would be implemented, and when you drill into the detail, that one point five million billion could well be a far smaller number than that. It, it remains to be seen. Yeah. Again, it comes back to this point that there are it, it it it's the lack of the underlying strategy that is almost preventing. I think the the government and or you know future parties from really tackling these inequalities and anomalies head on and I think that it's that understanding of well what are we trying to achieve as a as a country and uh, you know and as a society and how do we best support that through making sure that the tax system produces an, a fair and equitable result um, and that also we're not undermining or undercutting other policy areas by introducing adverse tax measures. There seems to be an absence of pro-business measures as part of the manifestos. What is your view on that? I find it disappointing because, let's be honest, they've had close to five years to get ready for this election. Yep. We all knew, give or take, when it was going to come. And OK, it came a few months earlier than we thought, but fundamentally they've had four and a half years plus to get ready for it. We've already known basically where we are as a country. OK, COVID and everything's created confusion. Lex has created confusion. But surely then they should say, OK, how are we going to be competing as a country? How are we looking to grow the country on a go-forward basis, given those issues? And you know, basically none of them have come up with it, come up with any real ideas. They haven't mentioned anything substantively. And given that, especially the Labour Party, especially the Conservative Party, talk about innately growth being the driver of our tax income as a country going forward, well, how are we going to get it? Just saying, oh, we're going to have growth, doesn't mean a thing. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Gabby. It was a pleasure speaking to you today. If you have any questions on our discussion today and how this may impact you, please use the form on our website and get in touch.